Hello and welcome back to SRB Gaming. Today I am visiting the Eris system. Eris is the largest and most distant dwarf planet. It was discovered in 2003, I believe, and it is the same size, actually just slightly smaller than Pluto, although it's 25% more massive. It is located in the Scattered Disk, which is a region outside the Kuiper Belt. It's a very distant region of the solar system. It has a single moon called Dysnomia. Dysnomia is uh, the largest estimates put it at about a 300 kilometer radius, and that's what I have it at in the game as I added it. Eris, on the other hand, is significantly larger with a surface gravity of about 0 0.8. Dysnomia is a 0 0.2, assuming the 300 kilometer radius. There have been no actual pictures of it due to its extreme distance, so we are using space engine textures again, although we do know the color, Eris is mostly white and highly reflect reflective. So, in the last videos you saw that I had a base at Charon, Pluto's largest moon. So, during when adding Eris, it turns out, I have to go back a bit, Eris was one of the first planets I tried to add as part of adding new things to RSS in KSP. But, uh, that means I still had an object file. So, when it created this new Eris, which doesn't replace textures, it still used the old object file. And what that did was it pretty much teleported my Charon base to the surface of Eris. And it still functioned, it's just on the wrong body now, and it's really far from Pluto. So, I tried to fix that by going back, but if I switch back and delete Eris again, then I get an issue where uh, the Charon base is floating 2100 meters above the surface of Charon, and I can't move, like all the controls are completely non-functional. So I had to keep them at Eris. Which means that the Charon base is now looking at Eris. Uh, it's still perfectly fine for exploring the Kuiper Belt, but uh, I guess it's a little unrealistic. But anyway, today we're sending a manned mission in KSP, of course, real solar system, and uh, they will be en they will be landing on Dysnomia, Eris's moon, and ending their mission, hopefully nearby the new Eris ground base, not Charon anymore. This mission involved a small one-man lander with Orim Kerman and the Vasimir transport ship. The Vasimir, this was the first time I actually ran out of fuel, like, in the Vasimir ship. That almost never happens. I always jettison it before it runs out of fuel. This actually happened. I had to start using the lander engine. <laughs> I also discovered on this mission that it's extremely cheap Delta V-wise to get back to the inner planets, assuming you can aero break. I could not test Earth because I couldn't actually get to click on it from here, but because um, I was a little lazy. But I managed. It's from Eris to Pluto, very large distance, 160 meters per second delta v. That's meters per second, not kilometers per second. I mean, that's not including the delta v to capture, but I don't know what that is. I assume it's not that high. The actual transfer is extremely low to Mars, 2,000 meters per second, two kilometers per second. You can arrow break there. So, uh, return missions were actually not that hard. I just don't have any capsules with parachutes, and I don't really want to bring these Kerbals home anyway, because they have use here in the outer outer solar system. Eris was originally uh, introduced as the 10th planet, because it was originally assumed to be larger than Pluto, although it is in reality about the same size. And it's one of the big reasons why Pluto was kind of demoted from planet, at least on the official status. The reason the video shows us to be skipping from the Vasimir to the lander is because I had an issue where the docking ports were basically super magnetic. I would undock and the do lander would not move. If I just jerked the SAS around for a while, <coughs> the lander would like slightly pull away, but it would be pulled back in by the magnetic docking port. If I time warped, the lander would move perpendicular to the, to the transfer stage. And then if I came out of time warp, the lander would be sucked back and collide. And if I went too far, it would crash. Eventually, I just time warped about 17 kilometers away from the transfer stage and figured, well, when I come out of warp, this thing's either going to be fixed or it's going to smash into the transfer stage at insanely high speeds. And it was fixed. It didn't slam into the transfer stage. I was actually extremely close from sending out the... Uh, exploration vehicle I have landed at the base that I used to explore Hydra and, and rescue this guy with that thing and leave his lander in orbit because I was not... Sh I, landing with the lander engine with the transfer stage attached would have given me too little delta V. The only annoying thing about having the base transferred to Charon... Uh, Eris, not Charon. 
is that Eris is uh, significantly higher mass, higher gravity. It takes about twice as much delta V to land, about 1100 meters per second, which is still really low for real solar system, but it's kind of annoying, because having the 400 and 500 on Charon was just pretty nice. It was easy to get back into orbit, but nothing I can do about that. Again, Eris is in the scattered disk. This is a region outside the Kuiper Belt. There, the orbit is extremely scattered. Eris is actually the... Although, it, the object that can probably get farthest from the... Excluding comets, farthest from the sun is Sedna right now. But, as of now, the farthest known object from the sun is Eris. Um, excluding comets. I honestly highly doubt that Eris is actually the farthest object from the sun, because I'm pretty sure there's more... Sedna objects. They estimated that due to the time Sedna actually spends at its perihelion, that would be the only time it would be detectable. Sedna with its extreme orbit. And uh, because of that, they figured that there's about a 1 in 80 probability of actually discovering Sedna, because they would have to discover it while it was at near its perihelion as it is now. And because of that, they realized, the astronomers realized that Sedna cannot be Unless it was just a complete fluke that they found it, there has to be more Sedna objects, because the probability of finding it is just so low. So they estimate there's actually 40 to 120 more Sedna-sized or larger objects out there somewhere in the detached region of the solar system. So I'm hoping they discover some more. They discovered 2012 VP113, which is the second Sednoid, although that is not as large as Sedna. It's still possibly a dwarf planet. <laughs> its orbit is not quite as extreme, although its perihelion, periapsis, is uh, farther from the sun than Sedna. Both the, those two, Sedna and 2012 VP113, are the only two uh, Sednoids discovered so far, although the VP113 was discovered, announced last year, so they could be coming out with more soon, hopefully. Though there was about a 10 year gap from Sedna. Anyway, my future plans for this mission is to, again, based out of the airspace, I'm presumably going to use Charon, but that's alright. Uh, I'm planning to go to Haumea next, which is another recognized dwarf planet. It's uh, ellipsoid shape, and it has two moons, which are larger than most of Pluto's small moons, not Charon, of course. Charon's huge, it's bigger than most uh, Kuiper Belt objects. But uh, that is my plan, and uh, now that I've discovered that the Delta V costs to transfer to other dwarf planets is so low, it shouldn't be an issue. And, uh, yeah, they can either land at Earth, which is a bit of a more ambitious mission, or return to uh, Eris. And at the end of the mission, you'll see that my lander actually landed about 7.6 kilometers from the Eris ground base. And running with a Kerbal more than 2 kilometers is extremely tedious, be tedious because you have to hold down the key the entire time. So, I... I tried to bring the rover because that was its purpose, and I learned that the rover is really only good within about a two-kilometer range because the only way to get there in a decent amount of time was to use a physics warp, and that caused uh, the rover to explode after a while. There was some glitch in the terrain, so I eventually just took the exploration lander and uh, flew it there, and I got within a kilometer, which was my goal, and then I ran Orem Kerman, the dysnomia landed Kerman, Kerbal. And uh, ran him to the lander where he met with Wilfrey, who is uh, of hydro landing fame. And uh, together they flew back to within about 200 meters of the base, which is close enough for them. So yeah, thanks for watching. Please, if you would like, we are currently in real solar system doing Kuiper Belt and Scattered Disk Objects. So if you'd like to suggest one, please do in the comments. I've heard a couple so far, but we've got... Lots of them, seriously. I'm going to post a link in the description that shows a list of all the stuff they found out there, and it's amazing. You should really read about it, even if you're not going to suggest anything. Please subscribe, it very much helps the channel, helps us grow, I can make more videos, yeah. And see you next time.